So from uh, from the desktop, you want to go to computer and get a copy of my folder from the Z drive, just like we always do. Uh, go to the Z drive and go to uh, Campos WordPress 2. And this is what I ended up with last week, uh, 1017, October 17th. So I'm going to copy that to the desktop. So copy that WordPress project from last week to your desktop. Once you have it on the desktop, we can rename the folder, the whole folder, rename it WP4. So I've noticed several mistakes keep coming up for people. You're going to copy the whole folder, and then on the folder you're going to rename it. I see sometimes people copy the zip file by itself and rename the zip file. That, that doesn't work. Uh, and. Uh, you copy it without the folder. That doesn't work either. You need the whole folder, WP4. And we'll put that into our www folder. So that's on computer. In the local disk. In the WAMP folder. And then www. So I'm going to move over that WP folder to my www folder. And that's step one. You need you need the, the site in the folder. And then step two, we need the database, and then we can resurrect the site and get started where we were last time. So I've got a copy of that in my uh, WW folder, and you want to open up the, or you want to start your web server software, the, the purple W. When WAMP server starts up, we need to activate the, the rewrite capability so that our permalinks properly work. So you should see that you've got down on the corner here inside your double arrow, show hidden icons, uh, you should see the, the WAMP server icon, it should be green. And then you're going to click on that. <coughs> In the Apache section, Apache modules, and which is the module we need to turn on? Rewrite, yes. So you're going to scroll down alphabetically to find rewrite module. And then lastly, we'll, we'll go back to uh, localhost. So open up your web browser, go to localhost. So here on, on localhost, you'll select PHP my admin. At the top, we'll create databases. And, uh, and remember, last week, uh, we created the database, but we kept it in Swedish. So I uh, guess we'll fix it this time. So you're going to select, uh, you're going to create the new database WP4. And under collation, you want to scroll all the way down to the section of UTF-8. Somewhere there, let's see, 16, 32, 8. UTF-8, and we're going with... General. Yeah, just general CI. 
CMD. Not sure, actually. But that's what I see on the one that's already there, ETF in general CI. So create this database with the name UTF-8 General CI Collation, and then create. So once you have the database, you can go to the address localhost slash wp4 slash installer.php. This is where we should be at. All right, everyone, so when you're on this screen here, remember you've uh, probably done it several times, so it, it's becoming second nature now, right? So here we're going to then select under name of the, of the database, WP4. The user is root, and there's no password. That's how it can connect over to, to your database. Question? Um, okay. um, I All right. 
So at this point, I'm going to test the connection. Everything is successful, and then I will confirm the warnings and run. So on this uh, step two, I don't need to change anything, so continue to run update. Step three, I'll select to save permalinks, and this is when we're going to log in with my information. So I'll put it up here. It's going to be uh, ADM Vic, and then password, of course, is Happy Cat. So if you're using my <coughs> project, that's the login information. So under username, ADM Vic, and then Happy Cat. Password. So it takes us to the permalinks screen, and just to confirm, it's set to post date. That's the one that's more SEO friendly rather than the default, which is just numbers. So that looks fine. And at the bottom, let's click Save Changes. And remember, that works because we turned on the rewrite module in Apache. Uh, if you don't turn it on, your whole site will break because it'll want to go to a, a page that technically doesn't exist. So we save the permalinks, and I'm going to close that tab to take us back to uh, the duplicator, and then we'll do step four to clean up the old installation files, the files that we use to resurrect the site. So click four, and then OK. And that takes you back to the site, and it tells you it removed all of that stuff. So we've got two tabs, the one where we're logged into the site, and then the one of duplicator. I can close that one. I, I really needed to do just steps two and four. Step three, about testing the site, um, that happens as we use the site. So we'll go back there. All right, so now everyone should be here. Let's confirm that we are, and now we'll start the big idea of today, which is starting to add projects and such. Question. Wait, can you tell me your username? Yes, it's ADM Vic. Mm -hmm. All right, so everyone is here logged in. Thank you. 
kill them all. So All right, so the plugin that we installed previously has um, the ability to do this whole e-commerce system. And now we'll look at the part that the consumer actually works with or, or looks at, which is under uh, products. Notice there's a little shopping cart. So click on products, and then let's add a new product. We'll jump right into it to start adding products. It already went back. It already it already went back. So I'll take it. So let's products add new. And this will be very reminiscent of a post or a page, but with many more fields. If you scroll the screen down, 
we've got a we've got a section to put the title or the name of the product, a section for product description, etc. We've seen that sort of thing before. Product tags and categories. I'll get into detail in a moment about that, because we we've installed the Yoast SEO plugin previously. We've got a little SEO section to to work with. We've got featured image that's been there before. But here's some of the new stuff: product pricing. Here's where we can select what is our default price, and if we're having a sale, we can put in that price as well. Uh, we have SKU, SKU, Stock Control Unit, I think it stands for. Uh, if you misspell control, I suppose. Um, but that's what, when we were talking about the database, that it had, okay, you've got these fields for each product. One of them is the SKU. This is uh, optional. Uh, you don't oh stock keeping unit there it is uh, you don't have to fill this in we can see how we can fill it in in a moment variations well that's uh, if I've got a shirt and I have large medium and small or if I've got in keeping with my theme here of pies six inch pie twelve inch pie this is a little bit complicated but we'll see how it works when we get to it. Taxes. We skipped this in the settings because this is another little complicated thing. But here's where we can set uh, how much tax are we collecting. And I believe this usually has to do with where is the product being sold to. So if I'm in California and I'm buying uh, this product but the store is in uh, Washington State, I'm still going to get charged California tax. This was a big thing with Amazon for a long time. Uh, you know, Amazon has been around since the late 90s. And probably one to three years ago, Amazon was starting to raise a fuss saying the government's about to change things and we're going to have to start charging you sales tax, even though we're an internet company. Well, they're headquartered, I think, in Washington state. Uh, but still, every state now, Amazon has to collect sales tax. So just last year or so, you might have noticed as you were buying on Amazon, it started to get a little more expensive. Because if you're buying something here, you need to be charged here because California wants to collect that revenue. So taxes, it's a complicated thing, but we'll get back to it. And then delivery. Uh, there's three little tabs here that we'll look at in detail, but now again, if we're shipping physical products, well, uh, we need to deal with shipping prices. At least with shipping, you do have a little bit of leeway uh, about how much this is going to cost because the post office and all of these providers give you the means of a flat shipping rate. So let's say for five dollars if you can fit your product inside the standard sized post office uh, shipping box then it ships even if it weighs you know two pounds or whatever. So here we can select it via flat rate based on weight, etc. And then we get more complicated. We've got a section of product details that we'll look at also, but let's create our first product. Let's go back to the top here. This is Victor's Bakery. Let's say we're going to very basically here create pecan pie. The name of the product, pecan pie. A description We'll just write one quick sentence. We'll say grandma's famous recipe. Atlanta style. 12 inch crust. Whatever. Here we can write as much as we want with bullet points and uh, links and we can insert images here. So we've got two places, actually three places, where we can add product pictures. One is directly in the description, and this again depends on your theme where these things will display. But if we select add image, this should display near the text that you've written. Conversely, on the right side, where we've got featured image, this depends on the theme, this could show a thumbnail uh, this should show a different thumbnail up on the products page. So we'll see the difference here actually. Let's say we want to add a picture, so after this text that we wrote, we don't have any pie pictures, but we'll just borrow some pictures. 
So press enter after what you write here. Add media. We should already have some pictures, so up on the tab from upload files, switch to media library. I guess we've got one. We've got this uh, chrysanthemum, so select it and click insert into page. That's a hydrangea, actually. Yes. Yeah. Last class you had mentioned you don't want to put heavy pixelized pictures on your website. So I mean, if you're trying to transfer from your camera, and it's like 12 megs or something. Is there a common way to downsize that? Well, uh, no, not a common way, but what I can recommend what I can recommend is that if you go to pixlr.com, you can uh, go to that address and that will help you resize your pictures down to some uh, manageable sizes. This has a bunch of tools, um, specifically Pixlr Express. It's a free web app. You don't have to download and install anything, but there is a mobile app for it. But over at pixlr.com, you can take your 12 megapixel images, sh shrink them down to a more manageable size. I think the more famous approach, though, is to use something like Photoshop. And then you open up your pictures in Photoshop and resize it. But Photoshop is not free. It's several hundred dollars. Uh, you could possibly use a built-in thing like Microsoft Paint, although... I, I like Pixlr a little better because it has more options. So you're, you're right about that. You don't want to <laughs> upload the, the picture straight from your digital camera. You want to resize it first. And Pixlr is a way that will help you do that quickly. So what would you recommend size-wise? Uh, Size-wise, I would say uh, a good for pictures, picture size, uh, maximum dimension either width or height doesn't matter but maximum dimension of a thousand twenty four pixels uh, so if it's a landscape picture the maximum width a thousand twenty four and usually when you resize these things it stays in proportion so I'm not gonna say a height because your height might not be the same proportion and that's okay so if your width is a thousand twenty four the height will will follow in proportion or if it's a portrait picture Again, the height of it, then, 1,024, and then its width will stay in proportion. That's dimensions as in pixels, but then file size. That's how much space does it take up on the server and such. That one's a little harder to say, but I would say if you try to keep it below um, 300 kilobytes per picture, that's good, because let's say you've got a whole screen full of thumbnails and pictures. If each one is 300, that's a quarter, or that's one-third of a megabyte or so. So three of them is already one megabyte. And you've got three more, that's two megabytes. Three more of that, that's three megabytes. So those megabytes add up, and it makes for a slower download. Even though we're getting faster uh, connections at home, perhaps our mobile devices aren't, aren't as speedy. So you don't want to load up a lot of pictures per screen. So if you keep your files below 300 kilobytes, file size, that helps. And oftentimes, file format should be JPEG, especially if they're pictures. Uh, that is, um, product pictures. So sometimes you want to put the image in PNGs are higher quality, but oftentimes those can be like 600 kilobytes. Uh, so usually for clients, I'm, I'm using at, a, at that size and, and that format JPEG, and that's when it falls within the file size. If I use ping, it's going to be higher quality, but higher file size. But this is because we're dealing with products, but if you want to use a better quality image just for websites, it's better to go PNG. Usually, yes. If you're if you're designing your website yourself and and you're making your own graphics for the site and such, PNG works well for that. But you have to be careful again because the PNGs can get very large quickly, and then too many pictures slow down your site. The download. So do you have to work? So you don't really 
you're more concerned with file size than resolution on this? Or, I mean, because it used to be like set it at 72 dpi or whatever. Yeah, I'm just assuming it's always 72 dpi. Oh, okay, okay. Because uh, anything higher would be more for print, and we don't want to give people such a high quality picture that they can print it themselves. If you have a file, uh, an image at 72 dpi, does it look the same on high resolution screens as it would on, you know? Well, here, here's the funny thing that uh, dimensions and resolution really go hand in hand. They're sort of the same. Si two sides of the same coin in that I could have a 72 dpi resolution image but if it's 3000 pixels wide that translates also to a 300 dpi picture oh, okay. see it's it's kind of it, it, the it's like a the two sides of the same coin it's a little hard to explain unless we get into a whole discussion of graphics uh, which we don't quite need to but if we go toward these sorts of um, goals here we should be we should be well off because 1024 pixels is big enough to be to look nice on on a regular monitor like this and on the new high resolution ones too and not so big that someone could steal your picture especially if you're trying to sell your pictures online and suddenly you give them a megapixel sized image well why would they buy it they just <laughs> print it themselves so uh, that's kind of more than we need to get into detail but overall this is what helps this should help you to decide on your pictures the one that we uploaded, uh, that hydrangea, it was it was around those dimensions. Notice that when we put it here, WordPress automatically shrinks it down to something that looks a little bit nice. And oh, I see it also brought in the, the caption that was there previously, so that's nice. Uh, let's contrast that with uh, the featured image because again, depending on the theme, the featured image might take prominence or the picture in the description might take prominence. So let's select on the right side, Featured Image, Set Featured Image. We need to upload another picture, so let's do that for a refresher. Uh, we only have one picture in the library, so let's select Upload Files. We will select the file here. Notice WordPress itself is telling me here, 3 megabytes maximum file size. So if I'm getting this out of my digital camera, it might be even too large just to upload. Again, it behooves us to then optimize our pictures. Select image, select file, and we've got pictures here inside of our, inside of our pictures library. So on the left side, go to pictures, sample pictures, and then pick any picture. shows the chrysanthemum. Notice up here, it's giving me a preview that this is 1024, like I said, but it's 859 kilobytes. That one is is a higher quality. Isn't that great way on the rest of uh, this? Oh, somewhere. They're inside of pictures. If you look on the left side, you'll see a little folder called pictures. So that I'm going to then select to uh, upload to, to set the picture as the featured image. Down here at the bottom, set featured image. Do you put it in as the single product image? We've got a lot of details we could be looking at, so we'll just use the defaults uh, okay. first and then we'll go into the details. Set Featured Image. And so here we've got a picture in the description and then we've got a picture as a featured image which we'll see later on once we actually see the product. But we've got other things to fill out. So uh, product tags and categories, these are very useful to us. These, this is for the organization. If people search, if people are inside of our website and then they're searching, because our uh, WordPress has a built-in search feature and someone searches hopefully they can find our product. So it's a good idea to utilize these and technically under products you can uh, tags you can have as many tags as you want um, but so that it doesn't feel overwhelming I would say put in about three tags what are the three things that describe this pick uh, this product 
For example, we're going to say gluten-free. That's something that people might be searching for. So I'll type gluten-free. Actually, uh, as, as regular with capitalization and such. This could be something, depending on the theme, uh, that people see, and so you do want capitalization and spacing and such. This product is gluten-free, so select Add. This product also features pecans. Maybe I'll have pecan uh, pies and cookies. Add that. Uh, yes, you could do that. Pecan pie, because you could have variations of your pecan pie, and then pie could be its own t a tag. However, uh, when something is as generic as pie, we might want to create a category, because this will tie us into a little bit later when I want to display all the pies for sale. I can choose its category because right now the default is every product I create, whether it's a pie or a cake or a cookie, they will all display on my products page. I don't want that. I want a screen with only pies and a screen with only cakes and a screen with only cookies. So we will create now a category. Click the plus add new product category and then we will type here pies. All the pies that we're going to make for sale will be categorized under pies. Now this is weird, they haven't fixed it yet, maybe next time. Here we've got plus add new product category, and here we've got add new product category. You click this to make the name, and then you click this to actually create it. So don't forget the second add new product category. Click that. And then that should result in, now we've got a new category, pies, and it's turned off. So think of pies as the super way to organize things. Uh, you've got, let's say, uh, you've got uh, a filing cabinet. And in that filing cabinet, it only has certain things, such as all your pie recipes. But then in the filing cabinet, you have uh, manila folders. And in those folders, you have the tags, pecan pie um, recipes, and uh, gluten-free recipes. So all of those folders are inside the cabinet. The cabinet is the category. The folder is the tag. You can have multiple categories and multiple tags, but this will be fine for the moment. This is something, though, that you want to think about early on in your process of creating your store. You want to sit down look at all of your products that you're going to sell. How can I organize these? Think of broad categories and then think of tags. Two or three, one to three tags per product. Think about how people might search for them. Think about how people might think about finding the product. Now we're in the section of WordPress SEO. This is, this is only added once you've got the Yoast plugin, so it's not there normally. But notice here, we've got three things we should fill out. Focus keyword, SEO title, and meta description. So each of these you can hover over, and that kind of explains what it is. And then on top, snippet preview. That's what Google search or Bing search would display. It would say pecan pie, Victor's Bakery. That's an incomplete result, isn't it? Usually there's a little description in your search results. This is where we can write that. So I'm going to write here 12 inch pie crust featuring grandma's famous recipe. Notice as I'm writing, it's telling me. You have 156 characters to work with, 104 left. 
it's a good idea to try to maximize that, right, as much as fits there. Because when someone searches and they get a page of a million results, if your description matches what they're looking for, that has a better chance of your link being clicked. So in order for this to be most effective, we could also put in a focus keyword, for example, that means if someone is searching on, on Bing, you know, pie recipes, or pecan pie recipes, um, that's what we could focus this page on. So I'm going to say on focus keyword, pecan pie. Notice as you're typing, this gives you a live um, search result suggestion in that people could be searching for pecan pie recipes, bars, muffins, pecan pie recipe Paula Dean, pecan pie cheesecake, pecan pie San Diego. So these are real searches that people are doing. This is how you can figure out how do I get found because everyone is searching millions of websites. This is the whole concept of SEO, search engine optimization. I teach a whole class on it where we spend three to five weeks, depending on the semester, talking about this stuff. How do I optimize every page of my site so that hopefully people find it when they search? Because maybe pecan pie is way too generic. You get back a million results, a needle in a haystack. But maybe if we're searching for uh, pecan pie muffins, there's less people searching that, therefore we stand out a bit more. That's a little bit out of our scope at the moment. This is something to start thinking about. And again, I, I recommend you take the next class, or the other class, uh, the SEO class, Search Engine Optimization. I'll talk about when it's being offered a little later. But let's just say our focus for this particular page, what people I would expect are searching for, are pecan pie. The plugin then also analyzes, have you used that keyword effectively throughout your page? Again, we'll talk about that a little more in detail, and we get into a lot of detail in the SEO class. Here I'm just trying to create a snippet that looks good if people are searching. Pecan pie, Victor's Bakery. We can change that if we want it to say something like famous, original, pecan pie by Victor's Bakery. That's what will appear there on a search result. So notice, if we did not have this plugin, it would have uh, done things for us, and probably not quite right. So with this plugin, we have the control to make our search results the best possible. We'll look at variations later, but what's one of the most important things when you're going to buy a product? The price. So let's go over here to product pricing. We'll just add a regular price and we'll talk about sale prices later. So you guys tell me, I don't know, what's a good price for a 12-inch pecan pie? $9.99. Okay, let's do $9.99. We have a bunch of options here. We'll, we'll come back to them later. But let's just say price is $9.99 for this product. We'll come back and look at product delivery later, taxes later, stock inventory. This is where you can set product has limited stock. By default, this is not turned on, which means we can always bake a new pie. But if we've only got five of them to sell, we can turn that on and say, we've got five. When the stock reduces to zero, send me an email and remove it from the site so people aren't trying to buy the sold out product. And the stock keeping unit is just any sort of number or 
code or anything in your system to keep track of your products. This is optional. Let's say I was doing something like um, PAI PP01. You know, whatever system you've got that keeps track of your products. This is saying everything that's going to be a pi has the pi prefix. This is pecan pie, so PP. When we do um, lemon meringue pie, I don't know, LP or LMP, 01. Maybe I've got 01 because it's the 12 inch size, and then I'm going to have 02, it's the 6 inch size. Whatever. This might not show up on anywhere on the forward facing portion of the site to the user, but this is internal to you. Product details, image gallery, short description, personalization, we'll come back to that. So now at the very top right, let's select publish. All right, so we've published it. We're in the dashboard. I want to see what does this look like for someone that visits my site. So let's hover over your site name and go to visit site so we can look at it from the front end. Visit site. Remember that one of the things that this plugin did was to create a few pages for us, such as products page. That sounds very sterile. I want it to be the shop. We'll do that later. But if you hover over products page, we've got products page, checkout, transaction results, your account. Cool, it created it for us. But click on products page. <coughs> products page. And what this shows, very cluttered interface, but what this shows is Here's that picture that I added as the, as the featured image, and here's the picture in the, um, in the description of the product. So I think here it's a little overkill, these two pictures, but what you can do here is uh, click on that and it shows it to you as a nice big size. That was that light box that we turned on in the presentation screen. We'll, we'll look at it again, but there's the picture, large size, description, this one has a link there. There's the text we wrote, there's the price. Notice if you hover over the name of the product, one of the, thing, one of the options that was in our presentation screen was do we make that clickable or not? The default is yes. So now what people can do is, if they click on the product, sort of like read more, then the screen shifts to just focus on that one product. The products page, this if we had five products, they would all be listed here. And once you click on a product description or product title, it focuses just to show us that product. The screen changes. There's, a, there's the featured image again, big at the top small on the side here, the description picture, quantity, price, add to cart. Let's say we want one. We want one. Again, that was an option inside of the uh, presentation. Allow us to select more than one. We put yes. If we want to say, if we want to select 12 inch pie, 6 inch pie, that's a variation. We'll get to that later. But here, click Add to Cart. That little pop-up that happened, that was another thing we turned on on the presentation. That was called the, uh, the fancy box or something? Mm -hmm. Fancy checkout box? That pops up for us at that moment. Go to checkout, continue shopping. I'll go to checkout. You click go to checkout, and then here's our screen. 
this took us over. If you've been paying attention to the address on top, now it's taken us over to our checkout page, which the plugin created. And then here you've got your product, your quantity, price, total, and then the whole system to buy the product, which still needs a little setup. And then here it says, how did you find us? Word of mouth, advertising, internet, existing customer. I have read the terms and conditions. Oh, well, what are they? If you click on it, I'm going to fill this in. So here a person would start to fill in their details. This is for shipping contact details. Remember, we can edit that term that appears there. And then shipping address, same as billing. Yes, just turn that on and it copies everything from the previous fields to these fields. But sometimes a person wants to be billed at a certain address and get shipped to another address. Yes. This gets filled in as soon as someone puts in their email address. If their email address is linked uh, to a WordPress uh, account. So the person cannot fill it in themselves. It gets filled for them if their email has a picture attached to it. So uh, we, it, we can't really go much further with purchase because we haven't filled in the whole purchase system yet, but at least we've created one product. Let's create one more product, then we'll take a break, and then again we'll talk about all of these other nuances that we still need to work with. So did everyone see their product and such here? Let's create another product. Let's go back to the dashboard. Back to the dashboard, over, hover over products, add new. We'll add another pie. Add new product. This one will be key lime pie. And then we'll say uh, under description, we'll say uh, perfect for summer, uh, 12 inch key lime pie uses organic key limes. Just any, uh, any description is fine. Product tags. Uh, notice if you select choose from most used product tags, if you turn that on, it'll say you've recently used gluten free and pecan. Let's say gluten free still applies to this one, so I'll select it. It does it for me. Pecan is not relevant at this point, so this time I'll write key lime. I might have key lime cookies. Organic, good. So under product tags, we can also write organic. So anything else that is organic, when people search, would come up. On another screen, we can go in and edit these tags in case we misspell them. Under uh, categories, well, it's a pie. Again, we're thinking about what is the what is the the super organizational unit to use, and we're doing pies. 
I'm going to contrast this product with the previous product in that I won't fill in very much of it, just to see the difference. But definitely we need a product name, a description, tags and categories. I won't change the, the SEO things at the moment. I can always do it later. Um, featured image. Uh, I will set a featured image. We need a different picture. We just put in a picture. We'll do something different here under product pricing. We'll write $9.99, but we'll say that this one is on sale for $8.99. We'll see how that looks different on the, on the front end. I'm not going to put anything on stock inventory, nor taxes. Let's publish. And then we'll visit site to see the result. Products page. There's pecan pie. Key lime pie. old price, current price, you save a dollar. If you click on the key line pie to see the full product description, there's a nice big picture, a smaller picture in proportion, and uh, you can add that to cart go to checkout and it still remembers the previous one you added. So we've got two products, one category. We'll take a break and then we'll talk about adding more categories and then uh, fixing up our products page a little bit more so that it doesn't look so sterile and other options that we have. One quick note before we take our break, uh, I think we did this back last month when we had part one of the class, maybe you'll have to remind me, uh, when did we create a blog post and set it to publish on a future date? Was that last month or this month? Last month. Well if you notice, there's the pie of the month that was published for us. Last month, if you weren't here, we created a blog post that would be published on the first day of October. It's been that time, so it auto-published itself. This is what I'm saying, that if you're going to create, if you're going to try to have good SEO, one of the techniques is to publish content on a regular basis. Spend one weekend, write five blog posts, and have them auto-publish once a month, and therefore your website is updating every month without you having to sit down and have writer's block every month. So the pie of the month for this month of uh, October, right there, published October 1st. We didn't do it, but we set it up and it published it for us. Yes. 
Well, let, let's do the break and then I'll answer your question. So it's a ten oh six. Let's take a ten minute break. We'll be back at ten sixteen, and we will uh, add more products and categories and such.